Let's put my jacket on. Um, good evening, ladies and gents, wherever you may be around the world, and welcome to this um, special live stream uh, on the late, great Jonathan Bowden. And I am uh, very happy and honored to have uh, one of uh, Jonathan Bowden's best friends and also a colleague, um, Eddie Butler, as our special guest this evening. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Butler. Uh, good evening. Um, I think just to start us off, um, maybe you could tell us how you first met uh, Jonathan Bowden. Um, well, I first met him in, it would have been in uh, the beginning of 94, I think, possibly the end of 95, sorry, 93. After we, the, I was in the BMP and we'd won a by-election in Millwall in the East End. It's the first election win of any nationalist party for years and years and years that caused a bit of a sensation and uh, another friend of mine uh, called Mike Newlands who was quite uh, prominent in the BMP then said oh I've got to admit this guy who is in the the, the Tory right uh, and do you want to meet him and have a have a drink and a bit of a chat with him and I said yeah right because I, I was always in favour of trying to breach the gap between organised nationalism and the Tory right. There was a right wing of the Tory party in those days on the sort of Monday club fringes, which doesn't exist at all now, but there was in those days. And uh, I was always keen to, for there to be a uh, uh, bridging the gap between these two parts. So I went along and we met in this uh, restaurant in Kensington called De Keys, which is a Polish restaurant. It's quite a well-known Polish restaurant that was actually involved in the, uh, a lot in the 60s uh, and 50s spy scandals involving Philby and McLean and all that lot. It was a, it had this sort of raffish uh, feel to it in those days, to Keys. It was quite a well-known place. We used to meet there, and we, we met there and had a Polish meal. It's a Polish restaurant. A Polish meal and what Polish wine and um, got along very well immediately. And we met there quite frequently thereafter for about a year. Uh, and then he got a little bit involved in the uh, in the BNP as well. And other, he didn't join then, but he, he attended a few meetings and um, uh, we collaborated in other various other schemes from then on. Cool. Um... I, like obviously we, we were talking before the stream and, and my apologies to some people in the chat we were a bit late and that's my fault because i was engrossed in the conversation with uh, mr Butler here and um uh, as as uh, you just said um uh, he was originally in the monday club yeah and i think before that in some other um right-wing conservative organization i seem to recall yeah, I've got, uh, he did this thing, I've, I've got a few uh, things to show you. He did this magazine called, oh, we got here, can I show it on there? The Revolutionary Conservative, which he did with another guy called Stuart Milson, who I used to know, he used to be in the BMP in the uh, 80s, I knew I know Stuart Milson as well. He was his close collaborator then, uh, Revolutionary Conservative. It was a... Uh, a sort of attempt, the Revolutionary Conservatives was a contradiction in terms, isn't it? And it was a bit posy, frankly. If you read, if you read these, these, uh, I'll get the camera there. These mm -hmm. journals they produced, they're a bit posy, um, but they're a conscious attempt to form a, a, a new right in England. Uh, there have been several attempts uh, to do to do this on the lines of the French New Nouvelle Droite, Gress, and that's sort of right. So that's what he's trying to do with Stuart Milson. Uh, and yeah, he's got, well, he's got an Armstrong, Wyndham Lewis here. Oh, what else have we got? It is, it's all, it, it's that sort of thing. It's an attempt to form a, a new right in England. Uh -huh. So that, that's what he, he did. He used to do quite a lot of writing in those days as well. There's another book I've got here. You see that called Demon, which is vaguely about as a sort of Yep. Oh, yeah, about sort of Jack the Ripper and the East End. He lived in the East End briefly before I knew him. And, uh -huh. uh, and um, that's a, a book about East End criminality, really. 
Um, but if you were to read that book, it, it, it's just like him talking. Uh, he switches from subject to subject. John Bowden notoriously, when he spoke, he'd he'd, he'd speak and say, um, "I would go, uh, I'd go to a meeting with him and say, look, so anyway, he's a very good speaker, as people already know." And he'd go to a meeting, and I'd say, "I'd be driving there with him," and I'd say, um, "It's very, it, it's very important that we get across this message at this meeting." Uh, we've got to talk about elections, for example. I was, I was, I was like, the, the elections officer when the election comes. So we've got to really get it into people's minds about this year's elections. We want to do this, this, or this about it. We want to make sure people come away from the meeting uh, with that message in their head. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd give a boring speech about uh, the nitty gritty of elections, and he'd come on. And he'd say, yes, we're going to speak about elections, elections. I remember the, uh, this is just an example how he'd speak. Uh, I remember when Margaret Thatcher won the election in 1979. 1979, and then soon afterwards she fought the Falklands War against the Argentinians. And the Argentinians, there's lots of beef in Argentina. Uh, and beef beef sandwiches, Fred Bentos, uh, corned beef. We, we used to eat that in the war. In the war, mm. we fought D-Day. All the people who died on the beaches at D-Day, <laughs> it, it'd go up in a total tangent. Every every sentence would lead to another one. Everything's not saying a thing about elections here. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll, I'll be sort of sitting there fuming, thinking, oh, God, totally distracting the audience. And it'd be, it'd be going on and on, giving all sorts of historical um, <laughs> allusions. And uh, connections, and the audience would be entranced with this uh, speech because he would do it all without notes. And then he'd end up saying, "Oh yes, and the Roman Senate, uh, the Senate of the people of Rome. Originally, the the Roman Senate was was elected, and yes, we want to fight the elections next week." <laughs> and, and, that'd be the end of it. and then he'd go like this. The audience would all stand up, and he'd always end his speech by doing this, which automatically gets people to stand up and give him a standing ovation. They'd all stand up and cheer him, thinking, what a great speech. And I'd be thinking, Christ, you know, the whole, you know, what was the point? You know, because they wouldn't remember a single thing of what I said uh, after that. And uh, but that was, and I'd go in the car on the way back and I'd say, God, Jonathan, you know, that was bloody pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd be very happy because they'd all been cheering him. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I was uh, w- w- one of the things I noticed that he did was he, he was one person who draw drew a parallel between Enoch Powell and um, Joseph Chamberlain in the, in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, and I'm kind of quite interested in in that era. In fact, I'm going to be doing a stream fairly shortly about that era when Britain really didn't have any allies uh, and simply relied on keeping a very large Royal Navy. What um, you mean about 1900-ish, 1910? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm very interested in that era. And one of the things that Jonathan Bowden did was he drew a parallel between Joseph Chamberlain in that era, who was trying to make the old Commonwealth of the British Empire. And for people in the chat, the old Commonwealth is obviously Britain, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and back in those days, South Africa. Um, and he was trying to turn that into something real politically, rather than something that was basically based on feelings and having the same monarch. Um, and uh, obviously he failed because in 1908, the Liberals won the election. Uh, mm-hmm. That was the, the election when Winston Churchill crossed the floor to the Liberal Party because he supported free trade. And um, that, the, what, what um, Chamberlain wanted was uh, uh, imperial tariff preference, yeah. which would have get given goods coming into Britain from Canada and Australia and so on much cheaper prices um, and would have encouraged political links, obviously. Yep. Uh, and I was I was just interested on that. And I thought on that note, I would play a little clip of um, uh, of uh, uh, Jonathan Bowden talking about Enoch Powell and so on, if that's OK. Yep. All right, we'll do that. People are ready to tell us, this is not possible, that is not possible. I say, whatever the true interest of our country calls for, is always possible. From life of a bullet that goes through screens. 
You hit the final screen and you're dead. What happens after? None of us know. In my philosophy, the energy that's in us goes out into everything which exists. I have no regrets. Fire, energy, glory, and thinking. Thinking is the important thing. That for me is life. Being white isn't enough. Being English isn't enough. Being British isn't enough. Know what you are. To read about your own culture is a revolutionary act. Knowledge is power. Listen to high music. Go to the National Gallery. Look at what we produced as a group. There would be a respect for the past glories of our civilization. I urge all white people in this era to look into the mirror and to ask themselves, what do you know about what you are? And if you don't know enough, put your hand on that mirror and move towards greater knowledge of what you can become. Greatness is in the mind and in the fist. The glory of our time is not, is not behind us. We can be great again. But the first thing that we have to do is to say, I walk towards the tunnel and I'm on my own and I'm not afraid and I have no regrets. Okay, quite a, there was quite a few um, images in that little video that I think were fairly strongly associated with uh, Mr. Bowden. Um, what, what, what did you think, uh, Mr. Bowler? What, of the film? Hmm. Yeah, well, it was. It gave him a few sound bites. He wasn't the greatest fan of uh, John Tyndall, who, who was on there. I noticed um, mm -hmm. there is a book. Uh, you mentioned the time those people there, and there's a book that he wrote a chapter in called. Can you see that? Have you heard of that book, Standard Bearers? No. Okay, it's called Standard Bearers: British Roots, the New Right by the Bloomsbury Forum, which is another group that I was in with uh, Jonathan, founded with uh, Jonathan and a few other people. Uh -huh. And there's a chapter in there on Joseph Chamberlain. Oh, who, cool. Excellent. By Adrian Davis, who we were talking about before the thing started. Another chapter on uh, Enoch Powell somewhere uh, by Sam Swirling, who was someone who Jonathan had dealings with in the, uh, in the Monday Club period of his uh, operation the one on? and Jonathan did a chat where's the one on there oh, there's a chapter on Powell in here Jonathan did a chapter on a guy called Bill Hopkins have you heard of Bill Hopkins yes yes he was a writer of the uh, new right uh, not new right angry young men in the um, and he wrote a book called the leap and Jonathan was very close with uh, Bill Hopkins um, mm -hmm. And before I knew him, and was uh, uh, he, he ran around with him a lot in in his early days, in, in Johnson's early days. And did he, uh, um, could, could I ask you, did did um, Jonathan Bowden lose all faith in the Conservative Party eventually? In the party, uh, I'd say yes. Um, see, that's another one of these misunderstandings I think about Johnson. He was. Uh, you know, his, his early career was all in the Conservative Party. And um, he he never lost that sort of aspect of his political view, but not in, not in terms of the party political side of the Conservative Party, but he was a sort of small C Conservative in many ways. Mm. Uh, yeah. 
a lot of people what? think he was much more hard line than that but he that's because frankly he he played to the crowd sometimes or very often when he gave when he gave speeches and when you were when he was in the um in the bmp in the 2000s if he gave a speech and, and gave a hard line reference it would get bigger cheer but uh basically from people who, who go oh yes this is what we want to hear and he did play to that which wasn't actually what he really thought when you yeah, actually I was actually watching an interview that he did with Greg Johnson um, not, not long before we started this stream. And he, uh, Greg Johnson actually asked him, like, if there was a, a political movement in the past that he identified with. And, and um, Jonathan Bowden specifically said no. He did not specifically identify with any particular um, movement in the past. And I think... I got the impression that what uh, Greg Johnson wanted him to say was that he identified with fascism or national socialism or something like that. Um, and Bowden actually went out of his way to say, no, none of them were really exactly what he wanted. So, no, he, he in the modern era, he identified actually, and he, he, he correctly identified the um, populist movements in Europe um, like the what was then the Front National, the um, League of Nord. What the, this is, um, you yeah, know, they're called different things now. But mm -hmm. um, the Vlaams Belang, these type, the approach of these type groups in the in the late nineties and in the two thousand early two thousands, those are the groups that he uh, identified as the ones that we should be following, not a, not a, their path their approach their solutions to the problems rather than more hardline ones he was realistic actually in that although when you actually spoke to him when he, when he's actually saying this is what we, which what these are the tactics that we should be adopting and a, a, approaching but, but at the same time he would make much more hardline um speeches because it would get him the plaudits that he, he loved that he enjoyed uh, so, mm -hmm. I, I wonder, I mean, look, there's, there's a whole question ar around this, which, I, which I'm going to ask, but I think it's probably a little bit too early in the, in the, in the chat to, to do it just now, um, about uh, the direction that British nationalism has taken. I mean, obviously, for people who don't know you, you you're a very, very long-standing British nationalist. Um, like, you, you were doing British nationalism when I was a teenager and about to go into the army, for example, and hadn't hardly thought about politics. So, um, but yeah, uh, so I we'll get around to that, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to do a little bit more um, uh, on, on Bowden himself, I think, before, before we get into those areas. Um, I have come to the conclusion, and, and as I say, like over the last month, I've probably watched everything there is online about Bowden, pretty much. Um, or have you seen Bowden. the film called um, England Expects? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, if you're, you could, you're, you're, you're in that. that. Yeah, well, I really wrote it and did it, but if you could post me a link to it, because I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's on my friend's channel, which is actually called Jonathan Bowden on YouTube. Oh, is it? Okay. He had, yeah, he had a, a cameo, cameo role in that. He was um, reading from, from uh, the book England Expects in it, wasn't he? Uh, was he um uh, no i don't yeah. think so he read um the, the um um a, a poem from the school that um nelson went to i believe uh, uh -huh. he did that and he did a he did a few sort of dramatic uh, i think he did a thing near um st paul's or Trafalgar square perhaps i can't remember where he was reading rather dramatically yes. i think that was at the beginning i can't yeah. I, can't, I can't remember what it was he was reading i think it was um Possibly a a, a a poem or something. I can't remember. It's so yeah. long since I've seen it. I'll have to, I, so I want to see it because I haven't seen it. For, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely send you the link after after after, after the uh, stream. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 on a friend of mine's channel actually. Um, we, all, we also were halfway through making a film that was going to be called um, England Story. I mean, there's quite a lot of footage of it with him in it, but it's never been um, put together. And it was sort of uh, it was going to be about um, it was going to be set in part of Essex, showing all the um, 
eras of English history from actually from the Ice Age, you know, the Celts, the uh, uh, the, uh, the Romans, the Saxons, the Normans, or the Vikings, the Normans, all the way up. So do you, one, do you, do you have uh, some of the footage for this? No, I don't. The the guy who did it, the guy who, who made um, um, England Expects, is a guy called Rod Gordon, and uh, he also made an earlier film that I did called uh, East Ended, and mm -hmm. the third one was going to be England's story, but we uh, we filmed probably two thirds of it, but he never, never didn't ever finish it, and he's probably got all the uh, all the footage and the outtakes as well. He's probably still got, I imagine. Well, but there's, quite there's, a lot there's of somebody, there's Jonathan somebody a bigger role in it than than before. Than, there there than, is some. There's somebody in the chat I know will be interested in that. So, uh, Richard Ford, please take note. <laughs> so, so, um, but, yeah, uh, really interesting. It's, it's a pity that that film didn't get finished. I, I thought the Nelson film was actually very good. No, so do I. <laughs> it, 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 it is. It's, and I'm, I'm very keen on, like, military and naval history, so I, obviously I found that very interesting. Griffin's obviously in it, but um, the... Um... Uh, Jeremy Paxman, I think it's Jeremy Paxman, because it was on the anniversary of the um, Battle of Trafalgar. And mm -hmm. Jeremy Paxman did a, a film, uh, with obviously with the BBC's budget and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And I don't think it was as good as that one. No, it was, was, it was a really, really good film. Um, I, like, I, got... I've been to Norfolk, to, to that part of Norfolk, to see where Nelson was born and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. And I've been on HMS Victory, and as the same, I, I told you before the stream, my son's actually serving in the Royal Navy, so yeah. I'm interested in that stuff. So. We, we literally went up to Burnham Thorpe, stayed one night up there. All three of me, uh, uh, Jonathan didn't go up. He, I went up there separately with Jonathan. There was a little bit of footage in... Um, in uh, um, where he went to school. I think we mm -hmm. possibly went to Norwich. I can't, I think. And um, and then another day I went up with me, Rod, and uh, Griffin went up there and we all stayed in one room in a, because Griffin's so tight, we all stayed in one room in a in a pub where they had room and quickly ran around and filmed all the different sequences in one day and came back again. It was, and it literally, it was, there wasn't a sound man or anything. It was just the three of us sitting there. It was, uh, it was, there was no uh, on a team of people making that film at all. Was this, um, Jonathan Bowden an interesting guy in like everyday conversation? Well, yeah, I, I regarded him as such because uh, he, he was probably my closest friend for about a good ten years or more. Mm -hmm. I associated with we have sort of long, uh, lengthy conversations every week or several times a week, probably. Um, yeah, I regarded him as, as a close friend and someone who's very, uh, you know, very good company and um, yeah, an interesting, interesting person to talk he was to. He was he was extraordinarily <laughs> well read, like really well read as far as I can work out. Because um, you can't really put that stuff on. You, you know, if you don't know that stuff, you don't know it. You know. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something about that. We uh, we used to go. A group of us used to go to the, one of the reasons why. He's, he's regarded highly in nationalist circles. Uh, this is going to sound a bit uh, snobby, man. But there's not a lot of intellectualism in, in British far-right circles or hardline right-wing circles. And if someone's got a bit of knowledge and they can name-drop things, uh, people aren't going to probe beyond that because most people won't know. Well, they've vaguely heard the person the person from using to name-drop but won't know anything else to ask anything else about it. So you, you can probably get away with things if, if you're not that well read, but you, there's a bit of pretense going on sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, a group of us used to go to Hay on Wye, which is a, a, for those who don't know, Hay on Wye is a, a small town on the English Welsh border, actually in, I think it's in Monmouthshire. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a town given over to second hand books. There's hundreds of second hand bookshops there. It, it's what the town specialises in. And any book you want to get that's out of print, you can go to Hay and Why, you probably better find it. And a group of us used, this is pre, uh, pre sort of online, nowadays you can get them online, can't you? But then you, there, was, there was no such thing as that. So a group of us, this is the late uh, late 90s probably. Um, we have been the late, yeah, late 90s, very early 2000s. A group of us used to go there every year 
uh, a group of nationalists and have a meal. We'd all stay in B&Bs, get them, have a meal uh, and buy books uh, and go in the pub as well, obviously. And uh, Jonathan used to obviously go and uh, he used to take a whacking great big like army kit bag and <laughs> got, uh, empty when he went and um, he'd uh, at Hay and Wide, they'd have the chief books, they almost, they're left outdoors almost in racks outside and so they're all a bit damp because they're outside virtually all, all year round and they're like 10p or 5p and I'd go with a list of like 10 books perhaps that I particularly wanted and I'd find them in a day or perhaps a day and a half, I'd find them all and then I'd a couple of other people we'd, we'd spend more time in the pub because I'd have the books that I wanted. I may book by two or three others that I've just noticed that I didn't particularly want originally, but they look interesting. And that's what I'd get. I wouldn't, but Jonathan would fill this kit bag, a very 200 weight of books, probably quite indiscriminate. It'd be, oh, that one, mm, that one, that one, that one. And it, and it, it would be a huge selection of books on a very wide range of subjects as well. And um. I'm convinced he only read the, the dust cover jacket on 90% of them. So he could, <laughs> so he, he could say, he could bluff his way through on what, on a little bit about these subjects, you know, but he, he, some subjects he did know a lot about, but he used to buy such a huge quantity of books. It was, it was slightly ludicrous. Is it? sit there and they'd all be the 10 P <laughs> or 5 P one. with a soggy, soggy penguin paperbacks well I, then, I will i will say this uh mr Butler, that like when i i don't do it now because like i'm an old bugger as i said to you earlier um but uh, when i was younger i probably read eight books a week nearly yeah, every week, nearly every week. Age, uh, i find it difficult to read now i used to do that as well when i was young i think would you get older i don't know whether i don't know whether it's age or whether it's um because people are fiddling on their phones now and reading stuff on their phones. But um, mm. I certainly find it difficult to read one book a month now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I am I'm. wouldn't say I read one a month, but I certainly don't read more than one every couple of weeks these days. Um, like, I'm in the middle of a book on the Peninsula War at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I just... The, the, the things I know about that Jonathan Bowden has spoken about and they're by no means all of them, but the things I know about that he's spoken about, he was pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. Well, he would, if he's going to give a talk on something, he'd probably choose to do something he knows what he's, uh, he's talking about. But he'd give, he would give the impression that he's got a much more eclectic knowledge than he actually had. And you could, if, there's, if it was a subject which I knew about, and he'd start talking, you'd catch him out quite quickly. But that's just the nature of the guy. But they will just tell you a quick uh, funny story. This is the, the, the mm -hmm. nature of John the Bowden as well. But when we went to um, how my one year, because um, I'd, I'd pick him up going through, because I live in London, I'd pick him up at a really near Reading, so I'd pick him up. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd only decided to go rather late. And so the B&B that everyone was staying was for, and I was going to stay in another one just down the road. And on the way there, someone rang. We, it was a mobile phones were around but they did they weren't smartphones so someone rang and said oh it's one of the people wasn't going to come so there was room in the bnb where everyone else is was going to be after all so i said right okay, i'll cancel one i'm going to and i would all say it's more convivial we'll all stay together mm -hmm. so i said to jonathan oh could you ring the, the bnb that um that i'm staying in and just apologize say that i've been called away for work or something you know just to upset them just um call away for work can't unfortunately won't be able to come and so he, he gets his phone out he rings up and says oh hello i'm ringing up on behalf of eddie butler he's um booking into your bmb later but he won't be coming they, they obviously said oh why not and he goes um he's found a better place they sent me a letter afterwards saying Someone rang on your behalf and said they'd found a better place. But how could you possibly know? Because our place was very nice and everyone likes our place. <laughs> so tip, that, that is actually typical Jonathan. He loved to get you into an um, uh, embarrassing situation. He, he was that sort of guy he was. A, b a bit of a shit stirrer, as we used to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, he, he, knew, he knows I had a low, low social embarrassment threshold. And I'm easily embarrassed by people acting in a in a 
in a way around me where, where I was people looking at oh, but he he didn't have a low social embarrassment threshold at all mm. and he, he would like to put me in a in a position that would make me feel uncomfortable he used to, let's see, that was part of our relationship if you like was that he liked to do that to to put me in a make me feel awkward you know yeah, he was, he was definitely a performer. I mean, a very talented performer. I, I, have you seen the film that he did about, not the speech, but the film that he did based on the Punch and Judy stuff? Is that the film where he's wearing some sort of mask? Uh, I think so, yeah, part part yeah. of it. And he, he's making yeah. strange noises and doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's through. a sort of arty party sort of... Uh, very much. ...avant-garde right. thing, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, I don't think it was very impressive, to be honest. But, so. I, I, I just thought, my God, this guy is like... You know, he, he's a full-on actor, you know, <laughs> when I watched it. Yeah. Well, there, there is... A, so when I was talking to you earlier, I think I gave you an example of one of his... Did I give you an, I gave you an example of one of his speeches, didn't I? Uh -huh. And and um, was that on? Was that before that we went live or not? I, don't I think it was remember. before, actually. Yeah. Okay, but he would do he would do a speech where he, it would be an, it would be a stream of consciousness interconnected and not relevant to what, what the subject matter should really be about. But everyone would love mm -hmm. it because it would be impromptu, no notes, delivered powerfully, and all that sort of stuff. But the, if anyone asked what was the real message behind that speech afterwards, you wouldn't really know. But it was just the 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 impression of, of the whole thing, and I would castigate him for this. Or when we, we'd we'd go to these meetings together, nearly always, and I'd say, you know, you were supposed to get across this 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 and this point, and you didn't really address any of those, those points. You were just giving a, 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 a an entertaining speech for the masses. And he'd say, "You think I'm a clown, don't you? You think I'm a, a performing clown?" and uh, there was an element. To, there was an element to him that he what that he was. Yeah, you know, sounds a bit cruel, doesn't it? But there, there was an element to him that he was a bit like that. He was a performer mm. rather than someone who would stick strictly to a topic that he needed to really address, uh, that the audience needed to be indoctrinated with. If you want to get a word. Um, when uh, was Jonathan Bowden uh, heavily attracted to the BNP when he joined it, or did he follow you into it, or did you follow him, or what? Um, well, what happened was um, we set when I when I met him, we set up a thing called the Bloomsbury Forum. Not just me and him, but a few other people, Adrian Davis, a few other people, <coughs> and. Um, it, the, the 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 Bloomsbury Forum, which published that that book, was set up to bridge the gap between the right wing, the Tory Party, and uh, over nationalism. As I mentioned earlier, that was something I I particularly believe needs to be done because uh, overt nationalism was effectively lobotomized because the more intelligent people would, were all in the Tory thing. The Tory side, because they didn't want to damage their potential <coughs> by uh, by being in a toxic organisation as the NF or the BNP were in those days, and you know after today as well. So yeah, it was, it was career suicide. So the more intelligent people who who potentially had a good career didn't want to touch it. So I, I wanted to bridge that gap and solve that problem because if if all the most intelligent people won't be in your party, then um, then it somewhat limits your party's potential to grow and develop. So that was the, the aim of the Bloomsbury Forum. And um, then in the, um, Nick Griffin took over the BNP in 99 uh, and he made overtures to us to get involved. He said he was going to create a new sort of orbit and lead it in a different direction or populist direction like the European parties that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And we so we, we all got back involved. I, I got back involved. He put his feet in the water uh, with, with the BNP. He didn't join then. But almost immediately, Griffin was involved in a big uh, shenanigans over finances, cor corruption, as, as he always did. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a big bust up. He sacked his treasurer, who was that guy I mentioned earlier, Mike Newlands. And his deputy chairman, a guy, a woman called uh, Sharon Edwards, and the uh, the uh, and there was a big bust up. 
we were sort of involved in it because we we were trying to get back involved and it totally um showed himself to be uh no different from how we believed him to be before which was in the, in the uh 80s i knew him in the 80s other people knew him in the 80s Griffin. and um so we actually went off and formed this thing called the freedom party which i think I yeah yes and um we we tried to form a party that was on the lines of these european type populist parties um without going into great detail of why and how it happened the bmp made a breakthrough then a couple of years later in in burnley mm -hmm. and got a number of people elected uh and griffin was using exactly the sort of language um which i'd said he should have used popularly and at actually one of these hay on my trips um i was sitting there and some one someone else who i won't mention who it was but a well-known ish person uh said what am i what am i me doing sitting here uh, griping about griffin and refusing to get back involved when um i should just swallow my pride and get back involved uh because they're, they're actually doing something they're actually getting people elected so I sort of thought about it, oh, really I should, and so I did. And uh, so I got back involved and I sort of let my colleagues down in the Freedom Party by doing that, including Johnson. And uh, got involved with the BMP, got someone elected pretty much straight away in London, and or in, in Hertfordshire actually, on the outskirts of London. And um, Jonathan, was, had been in touch with me all, all this time and he says oh i think i should join as well so he then uh, came in and joined the bmp as well and uh this was in uh 2003 that would have been and um i prevailed upon griffin to uh griffin had a, a thing called the uh i think it's called the advisory council i can't remember what it was called it's like his like uh body within the mm -hmm. party who advised, supposedly advised him on things and i prevailed upon him to make i was made i was national elections officer by then griffin appointed me that virtually straight away and um uh, he, i've got griffin to appoint jonathan the uh, cultural officer mm -hmm. so he was because he's got sort of weight intellectual weight it lent free credit more credibility to the party by having someone like Jonathan's the cultural uh, cult, minister of currently is that title but it's something like minister of culture or something like that maybe. i used to joke that he was like that you know the um barry humphrey's character pat uh you know dame edna everidge you, well, you do you know dame Ever dame edna everidge Yes, yes, I know. You're and he's got about. this other character, Barry Humphreys, isn't it? Yeah. He's got that, I, I don't know he's alive or dead now, but he's got the other character called Sir Des Patterson, I think his name was. Yes. Was the, the Australian Cultural Affairs attaché. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> All of these wrestling in mud. I think he was that he was like uh, the the uh, Cultural Affairs attaché, but he was the um, that was he was appointed like uh, the cultural officer. Uh, on the direct on the uh, advisory council so <coughs> so had a position on there and uh, he could go around meetings and give speeches as the cultural officer of the of the party and it gave the party more weight although griffin didn't like it because <coughs> he was a better speaker than griffin and he still saw him as a rival really okay yeah yeah um all right on, on that note i've got another little clip that i'm going to play of jonathan bowden um talking about going around because he used to go to some pretty rough pubs and stuff to give speeches didn't he yeah um and i've got a little clip that i'm going to play which is jonathan bowden talking about that experience so i'm just going to do that I remember it's an Essex meeting, some bikers meeting, they're almost chanting in them, you know. I sometimes think, you know, my father's a very sort of posh bank manager, and I'm here in this meeting, I've spoken in some utter dens, you know, in the pits. I've spoken in one place in Burnley with barbed wire all over the meeting. And the, I said to the organiser, why is there so much barbed wire over the, over the, the, the meeting place? And he said, it's to keep 
school bag, John. <laughs> right, but he didn't tell me which which part of the population he's referring to. Mm -hmm. um, shutters on the windows, you know, and uh, there was one sheep in a place in South London, Merton or something. I spoke at. Good Lord, it was sort of, you know, sort of, yeah, he's right, you know, some bloke would get up and say, you know what I mean? I And the other bloke would say, oh, I don't agree with that, mate. I think you need sorting out. And they'd almost be fighting in the middle of the meeting. And the organiser would go down and sort of kick them like a dog. He had to drag one bloke out, hitched him up. You better turn this off. Hitched him up and threw him out of the meeting saying, get out. You know, you're getting out, boy. You know, it's, it's a beer cellar, you know, it's sort of semi uncontrollable. And yet you do have a power over them. They listen to you. It's interesting because, you know, there's a few heavies there like Steve and so on, you know, but there's a sort of this, you know, if it, it, but they have a sort of admiration for you in a way because they, they, they want you to say, well, they can't. That's what it boils down to. Not capitalism. Yes. And, uh, and they admire you for it as well because they're sort of, there's also a class love hate relationship as well, you know, because they sort of, so the part of them doesn't like you and a part of them adores you and it sort of vies, the one vies with the other, you know. Um, but then patriotism is the only socialism, really, because it holds people together in their difference, because people are different. I says, a bloke. I think there was a little bit of exaggeration going on. Yeah, he was. He was. He was, he was <laughs> quite a lot of that was he's making it sound a lot worse than it was. I don't doubt. But um, he has had a, a, there's a lot of truth in what he says, which is something we discuss a lot. Which is that the, the British working class do have have always craved a top to come along and lead them. Mm. Um, that's what uh, that's what they've always wanted. Jonathan wasn't actually a top at all. Um, mm -hmm. His background was rather humble, but yet he spoke and sounded like a top, but he wasn't at all in his in his social upbringing. No, he, he, he went to a, um, I, I believe he went to a Catholic grammar school, did he? Yeah, in Reading. Yeah, and he he was from a village in Oxfordshire. Uh, uh, some of my some of my family. Are from the Henley area, and uh, so I know the same villages where um, Jonathan was brought up. Mm -hmm. And um, there's there's one uh, where I had a drink with him there once, and I said, uh, "Oh, should we go to Peppard? This is a place called Peppard." And he goes, "Peppard, Peppard," <laughs> his yokel accent would come out every so often because his natural accent for, in from this sort of rural poor background he's not trying to make out in that clip his dad's a posh bank manager this is part of his fantasy but mm -hmm. his, his his background was rural poor in in south oxfordshire where the the people speak with a yo what you would call a yokel accent. Yeah, I, I know I know that area really well actually around Have Marlow, you? Marlow and uh, Henley on Thames and that area. I know it really well. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, Peppard, and um, yeah. So he, he he would every so often, and an unguarded <laughs> unguarded moment. <laughs> This little yokel accent would creep out because he affected, <laughs> <laughs> he affected this um, posh, plummy voice, which, mm. which uh, people, as he said in that little clip, people sort of respect the work, the British working class respect it. On the one hand, they sort of say, oh, toughy, you no, know, poncy, bloody snobs. But then if, if they if they if a posh person comes in and starts talking the talk, they doff their cap. Oh yeah, you're the bloke, you know. That's just the. Name. I, That's I, 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 I was born in um, Bermondsey in, in inner South London, mm -hmm. like on the south side of Tower Bridge, and um, so I, I, my younger brother was a Millwall supporter, you know. So, <laughs> but. Um, so I know those kind of areas, and that's why I knew he was exaggerating a little bit about the pubs, because, like, you know, yeah, okay, you, 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 it could get rough in a pub, but by and large, people were were pretty civilized <laughs> for the most part. And then to Jonathan, people are, t are tough, like the people mostly, not all. I, I could talk later or any time you want to about exceptions to this, but most people are very deferential towards uh, towards him. And 
the fact that he was a toffee nosed or seemingly a toffee nosed uh well-educated seemingly seemingly oxbridge he, he wasn't from oxbridge but seemingly people like that the, so the, the the meeting i never went to i wasn't at the meeting in Burton, for example but i know the, the venue and i know the sorts of people he's talking about at that meeting they were sort of scaffolders and, and people like that they were mm. very rough and ready but good good types yeah and um so it was a fairly uh, rough atmosphere very often at these places but he you know it was not like he was ever um personally in any sort of danger at all actually no, well one, one sort of thing about jonathan he always used to wear steel tack <laughs> <Really? laughs> yeah. he'd wear a suit and these sort of clonking steel tack you look down he'd have this pair of steel tack boots which um i think he wanted to, in case he had to kick it away <laughs> Kick his way out of trouble or something. Like Insurance. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You, you you make him sound like more fun, perhaps, than his his uh, persona online tends to be these days. Um, yeah, he was. He was. Yeah. Well, I. Yes, he, he was a. Uh, I I saw him as a fun person who you would have I'd have a laugh with, you know. Mm. Um. Yeah. But uh, with, as I think I said to you on, uh, before we came live, most people only knew him when he was putting on a, a, a persona for their mm. benefit at meetings and putting on a, a presence for them, which wasn't really him. Uh, and, uh, you know, most people's st stage presence isn't the same as their real presence, is it? So, um, yeah. I, t I find it extraordinary, though, that he could go to these working class pubs and talk about quite obscure figures sometimes, at, like considerable depth. And uh, the, 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 these guys actually seemed interested. And in, like, I, you never hear any barracking or people being bored or talking in the background or that kind of well, stuff. He would, he would, the, the tone of his voice, he, he projected well, very well. He spoke in a they probably just listened to the rise and fall of his voice more than anything else. And he would use the techniques of, you know, when you're supposed to say things three times and the third mm. time with an effect and that gets people. Uh, he would employ that regularly through the speech. And if he, and he was quite adroit enough to tell if, if the, if the audience was nodding off, he'd know to suddenly fire it up. So mm. he, he was quite receptive and, and, to what was going on in front of him, he he, he didn't just talk uh, like some speakers. Uh, uh, JT, for example, John Tyndall, yep. he could talk and have something planned that he wanted to talk and couldn't deviate from what he had already planned, and could could lose an audience. I've seen JT lose an audience several times uh, because he wasn't flexible enough to, to change tack. Whereas Jonathan wouldn't really do that because he'd be he'd be watching the response to everything he was saying on he he fed off the responses that he got from the audience uh, uh, very effectively mm. and so i don't think Johnson would ever would ever have lost an audience yeah he, he seemed to be able to do these marvelous speeches with no notes yes i don't think i've ever known Jonathan to do a speech with notes did did he not even do bullet points or anything of that nature um, no, not that I ever knew. JT wow. did, for example. He, he always had notes. Yep. Uh, but Jonathan, I don't recall ever using notes. I, I, one, one thing I think you can probably definitely say about uh, Jonathan Bowden is that he was probably the last great British orator in, in terms of like the great speech makers of history, because I don't think anyone since then has come close to him. Um. Well, in all political parties, I don't know necessarily about that, but uh, um, he was certainly he was a good orator. Yeah, yeah. Good orator. I mean, he was absolutely up there with people like from from the nineteenth century, even you know, where, where speech making was an art. Yes, um, I'm not really sure that you know, I don't want to sound uh, pouring cold water on this, but. As I said, the, the most the, he wasn't a disciplined speaker. Very rarely was he a disciplined speaker. He would, he would, it would sound intelligent, 
but if you actually said this is what i want you to say these are the points you've got to get across he wouldn't really do that very often he would stray widely in in, in the course of his talk nearly always and I, I i don't know whether gladstone for example would have would have done that i don't I suspect he wouldn't yeah you're probably you're probably correct but i mean like someone like churchill for example uh who or was church, totally, he, church. he 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 like dictated his speeches before he did them so yeah, like he knew know, exactly yeah. What, yeah i don't know if churchill spoke up without notes did he no i don't think so not not as far as i know but he's regarded as a, as a great orator um like I'm, I'm a bit ambivalent about Churchill, um, to be honest, because I think his military and naval strategic judgments were not always particularly good. But um, that's my only issue with it. Well, and also, I, I, I think his crossing the floor to the Liberal Party in 1908 was a disaster for Britain. But I mean, you know, there's also that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that in terms of public speaking. There is, there was an element of genius about John, Jonathan Bowden uh, in terms of public speaking. Yeah, yeah he certainly, uh, in nationalist terms, uh, in the area of politics that he's interested, he was certainly the best speaker there's been, uh, certainly in the last 30 years, I'd say, anyway. Mm-hmm. Who would you say was better than that before that? Um, Martin, Web uh, do you know of Martin Webster? I've heard of him, yeah. Okay, Martin Webster in his prime was very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. That might be an unfashionable thing to say for people who know who Martin Webster was. Um, yeah, before... before um, that was in the seventies. That would have been Webster. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's the only one that I've heard myself who who would um, rival Jonathan. We've got we've got someone in the chat saying Enoch Powell, um, which brings me on to a question I wanted to Thank ask you. you: Did did you or um, uh, Jonathan Bowden ever actually meet Enoch Powell? I didn't. Um, I, in the time when um, I can't remember when Enoch Powell died now, but when he was politically active, when I was, I joined the National Front in 1980, so I wouldn't have been going around wanting to speak to Enoch Powell because he was sort of regarded as a reactionary, uh, a bit of a fuddy duddy reactionary, really, but by us in in the 80s, and so I wouldn't have really sort of gone around wanting to sort of suck up to him. Um, mm -hmm. And then by the time I got a bit older and more mellow on such subjects, I think Enoch Powell was a bit uh, too old and out to sea by then. Yeah. And he was also in Northern Ireland. Uh, Jonathan, did he meet? I don't know if he probably... If he, met him, it would have been, if he met him, it would have been like, hello, Mr Powell. It wouldn't have been any sort of meeting of minds or anything. Yeah, I, th I think uh, somewhere or other I've seen um, Jonathan Bowden say he met him, but quite briefly. <coughs> yeah, I'm still, I've certainly never seen a photograph. And he, I don't, it, look, if he met him, it would have been at a function and he would have shook in his hand or just seen him at, at a function, at a Tory yeah. function or something, a fringe meeting or something. But um, there was no proper meeting between them, put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, I, I, moving on. I don't a think bit. Enoch Powell, going back to what I don't know, I, I can't see the chat, but I don't think Enoch Powell was a great orator, really. He was a, uh, I don't think he sort of set the blood running with his speeches. Uh, no, I kind of agree with you, actually. I don't think he got people up cheering and shouting when he, uh, when he gave the speech. That wasn't the type of speech he gave, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think what, what I would say is I think Enoch Powell was probably the last chance to save the Conservative Party. <laughs> Obviously, they passed up on it. Like my father, for example, and as I say, I was in, in the South London. My father was a huge supporter of Enoch Powell. So, you know. But, but the, obviously, they passed him up and they elected the um, um, probably... 
yeah, the probably pedophile yacht, yachtsman instead. And um, that was the end of them, as far as I'm concerned, to be honest with you. Um, someone in the chat uh, is asking what your opinion of Joe Owens is, or if you knew him. Joe Owens from Liverpool? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I know him, or I knew him. I haven't seen him for years. Uh, not exactly much to do with Jonathan Bowden, but um, I used to... Uh, I used to be on friendly terms with him years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. I believe he, I believe he slagged me off on on one of his films at some really? point. He slagged virtually everybody off at some point. So, um, yeah, I used to get on quite well with him. Um, he was around in the late eighties in Liverpool, so I knew him from then. Mm -hmm. and, uh, knew him off and on. I hadn't probably seen him for. 15 years, probably. Wow. All right, I'm, I'm going to uh, move on to a few questions that some of my friends have asked. Like, I've got a little Discord, which is basically just for streaming and so on. And um, uh, some of my friends in the Discord have asked a few questions, if, if you don't mind me asking those. Uh, where are we? First one. Forgive the dead air here, guys. I'm just trying to find this first question. Okay, I'm going to move just move on to these. This one's too difficult to find. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. Um, I've already asked the first one of these, which is how Bowden got involved with the BMP. Um, what were Jonathan Bowden's thoughts on the BMP collapse, um, Mr. Butler? Um, okay, well... In, um, I'll, st I'll start at the beginning on this. He, he left the BMP um, in, I think, say 2008. I'm, I'm going slightly on memory here. Um, because, as I said, Gr Griffin saw him as a rival uh, because he was popular and he would be going, he'd go to meetings, give a good speech all around the country. And um, people would whisper, oh, well, they got to Jonathan Arthur and say, you should be the leader, you should be the leader. And obviously this got back to Griffin and Griffin didn't like it. And he had this group of people on a low grade um, uh, blog type site um, who the real, Griffin liked to associate with the very worst elements in, in national, the scummy, real scum types. And there's this low-grade scummy type of group. You had this blog that someone told me about that they put a story up saying at Griffin's behest, saying that Jonathan was a, um, a pedo or something like that, a nonce or a pedo, something like that. And um, so I looked it up and, and saw it. And I... Uh, so I, I rang Jonathan, or let someone speak to him. I said, oh, by the way, Jonathan, there's this uh, site that's gone up saying you're a, you're a nonce and a pedo, and uh, Griffin's got these people who went under a, under a, name, a particular name. They're flagging you off. It's clearly at Griffin's behest, and they're calling you this, that, and the other. And I thought uh, that he'd just say, oh, what a bunch of tossers or something like that. Griffin's a prick or something like that. But he didn't. He actually had a bit of a, a attack of the vapours and um, a bit of a sort of mental uh, collapse and resigned. And he said, you know, virtually within seconds of me telling him this on the phone, he said, oh, I've got to resign, I've got to resign, I'm resigning. And I thought, what the bloody hell? And because um, he didn't have, it, as I said to you in, when I was talking to you off, off air, although he spoke about the Superman and the... the uh, um, that was his ideal. The uh, new human stuff. New yeah. Superman. He didn't actually live up to that himself. I wouldn't. I don't. I didn't hold it against him that he 
at all, personally, that he didn't live up to it himself uh, because that wasn't his role in, in politics or in life. Well, I, I, as you said, Nietzsche himself didn't live up to it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And they, yeah. So, but I was slightly shocked that it collapsed so readily, uh, just a bit of verbal from the tossers, really. And um, uh, he, he, he resigned, he left, he wouldn't go to anything or do anything. He was just edging back into it to do, he started making a few more appearances um, about a year, after about a year of uh, absence. And I was trying to persuade him back and get back involved and all this sort of stuff. He, even, he was no longer a cultural affairs officer because he had, he had resigned. So I said, okay, we don't bother about doing that. Just come back and speak at a few meetings and get back involved. Uh, the party's bigger than Griffin, this sort of thing. You know? And um, then, so he was very anti-Griffin because of this, because Griffin had, um, it was clearly uh, Griffin's behest that this attack had been made upon him. Bastard. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, but he was in inching his way back in. When in 2010 there was a huge bust up, which led to the, uh, which led to the whole folding up of the BMP, which was the, uh, um, it was the catalyst for it was um, Mark Collett, who uh, you probably obviously know of. Yes, yes, uh, of. yes. <laughs> got involved in a, um, a threats to kill thing, with uh, threatening to kill uh, John. Um, What's his name? Bloody Dowson and Jim Dowson. Have you heard of him? Jim Dowson. He was a mm -hmm. he's sort of now running around with Griffin now, and um, and Griffin allegedly. And I was very close friends then of, of Mark Collette, a very close uh, collaborator of his. And I was roped into it because Collette uh, basically named me as as his uh, ally <laughs> and uh, brought the whole thing. <laughs> Well, I'll call it <laughs> brought the whole thing crashing down around around us, um, and um, various other people were mentioned and there were sacks and so forth, and it led to a great big schism between me and Griffin, and Bowden sort of supported me, but because he was very uh, worried about being um, personally implicated in this, because I had I had. Um, I mentioned this group that had, uh, attacked Jonathan uh, a couple of years before, you know, or whatever uh -huh. it was. And um, they obviously were, were used by Griffin to attack me a lot. And they had about three or four blogs attacking me and making stuff up or elaborating rumours about me. And so the, the internet was filled with, with uh, Griffin was a, was a master at um, filling the airwaves with, with scandal and bad stories about you guys. Just have done this, done that, done the other, being a real uh, rotter of the worst order. Mm. Didn't really bother, all this sort of thing doesn't really bother me, but Jonathan was very worried about getting implicated in this, so he stayed very much in the background, didn't want to get, get involved, although he did make a, a statement supporting me in this schism. And uh, so he, but he was very anti Griffin, and so um, just, but, but he sort of kept his distance a bit. And mm. uh, didn't want to get too much involved. And then about a year and a half later, he had a, a, a breakdown, which led eventually a, 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 a more a, a mental breakdown, really, that led to his death. Yeah, we, we, we spoke about this before we came on air, and um, I, I asked you then, I'll ask you now, um, do, do you think that contributed to um, Jonathan Bowden's early death? I'm not saying it caused it, but contributed towards it? It contributed, I think. Um, it did contribute it. The the um, the circumstances were he went to he'd, he'd been to America, maybe maybe at least once before, uh, several years before, and he'd done a series of talks there. Uh, Apparently, very successful from my yeah idea. yeah, and very uh, really impressed them. He was the he was the sort of person that an educated American nationalist. Would in their imagination see a, a, as a an intelligent Englishman. That's how he came across them. So he could talk about Shakespeare, Dickens, all these sort of uh, cultural uh, uh, footnotes he could he could make. And 
he went down very well, very well. Uh, they always sort of, uh, when can we possibly have Jonathan back? We must have him back. And uh, he was invited back. And uh, the there was stories that there were the meetings in America were going to be disrupted by whatever they're called in America, Antifa, whatever, whatever their group. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, and, the, um, the theme has gone. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jonathan was of a, a nervous disposition. He, he, you know, I told you he went around with um, um, still talking about boots. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he was he wasn't uh, he wasn't a brawler he wasn't someone who get involved in um pisty cuffs and stuff like that yeah no he doesn't strike me as that sort of guy at all no. he wasn't uh, that uh, that wasn't his that wasn't him and he was a little bit nervous of that sort of thing and um on the on the something like the day before he was going to get the flight he had a complete breakdown and the flight to america he had a complete breakdown he was literally um he was he, he was put in someone's house quite one of person's house in west london mm -hmm. and uh well, another guy was coming in quite one another quite one guy was coming into the house he's, he's told me it was what happened and uh john was standing behind the door with a great big machete thinking that he, he was thinking people were after him all the time and he almost like stabbed this guy to death as he came to the door sort of thing and he and he he was uh, like a cat on a hot tin roof and he, he went back to reading and was arrested i i'm told uh he was arrested walking around naked in reading with a great big meat cleaver of some sort wow. and was was basically se sectioned uh and um thought he was hearing voices i spoke to him on the phone several times and he was in this uh, establishment of some sort he's seeing he hear voices people telling him stuff were watching him from the bushes over the road then I'd say there's no one over the road. There's no one telling you, no, no, that's right. There's no one there at all. And then he'd say, yes, there's no one watching over the road. And um, he, he, he developed a sort of total paranoia, persecution paranoia. Uh, and uh, I, the last time I saw him, I went and met him and took him out. And they, they allowed him after a while, they allowed him out on like day, day release type thing. And we took him out for... Um, me and there uh, was some called Sharon Ebanks. I don't know if you, uh, she was from Birmingham, and mm -hmm. uh, he, he he had um, she she came across to me when I was in the BMP as a very rough and ready sort of brummy woman with tattoos and quite severe. Mm -hmm. But I got to know her. And she's actually a very intelligent person. Then I understood, and he, Jonathan was very close to her, and I understood why he was because she was actually very, very intelligent and um, well read and quite intellectual. In fact, his appearances were deceptive, sort of thing. Yeah. And anyway, we took him out for a meal in, in a pub in Sonning. Do you know Sonning? Yes. Yes. It's near, quite near Peppard, actually. Yeah. And uh, on the river, but Sonning's halfway between Reading and Henley. Very yeah, nice, pretty uh, part of the world. Yeah, very picturesque. We went to a nice pub there. Took him out for a meal. Had a look, look around the churchyard. Um, he was totally normal, a bit subdued, but totally normal, because I think he was on um, drugs, which repressed his uh, paranoia, probably, but also repressed his his more uh, fiery temperament, and more, uh, so he was on a sort of level keel rather than. Well, usually he was quite up and down in his uh, nature and um we dropped him back after several hours we dropped him back and i sort of, sort of wistfully saw him waving as good oh, you have to leave me sort of thing from the, the steps of this uh, secure accommodation that's actually the last time i ever saw him and um yeah and, and he was released uh, into some sort of sheltered uh, properly sheltered accommodation where he, uh, where he could come and go as he pleased uh, uh, for about six months and died of, a, of, I think, a heart attack due to the medication he was on, I suspect. And, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he made a few speeches during that period <coughs> where he's, he's, he's somewhat monotone. He's not um, he's not as fiery as he was. It, 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 it was a different person. because Some, I think some of them are still quite good, though, as, as we were saying yeah, before the stream. Yes, the, 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 if you watch 
the before and after speech. Some one of one of the things like I saw one of the speeches on YouTube, and he's talking. He's doing this mm -hmm. all the way through it. It's like a, you know, it's very. When I watch, I think, God, what's happening there? And he, he was just doing that the whole way through. He was talking mm -hmm. quite intelligently, but in a slight monotone. But his arms are doing that the whole way through. And uh, he spoke in he spoke somewhat in a monotone afterwards, but probably more. Um, uh, slightly more intelligently because it, it was less it was less his performance was less theatrical and he was putting less into the performance and more probably into thinking what he was actually saying mm. and i think i said to you there was um there's some um tapes of him talking to that american spencer guy i can't mm -hmm. remember what his first name is. is it robert spencer richard, richard, richard spencer yeah, richard. yeah and um where they're actually quite intelligent speak uh, talks and, and I'm ninety percent sure they were done after his um, after his collapse, and between in that short period between his collapse. Yeah, it was, a, it was about two thousand and eleven. He was doing that stuff, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, that would be about right, probably. And uh, yeah, and he uh, he was a bit of a burnt, uh, empty husk sort of thing at that period. Uh, when I see the films of him. It's a bit shocking, actually. That particularly this one where he's doing this the whole way through it, you can sort of yeah. see he's a he's a damaged uh, creature, you know. Yeah, that must have been really sad for a good friend like Jonathan Baldwin was to yourself. Um, I think I, going back to your original point, I think uh, there's a degree to which uh, that incident with Griffin, Griffin's. Uh, sort of persecution of him pushed him towards his death mm. but probably if it hadn't been that it would have been something else you know so uh, yeah maybe, maybe. I'm, i've got i've got another little clip i'm going to play now which actually relates to what we're talking about and then i've got like about six or seven questions that people have asked me to ask you uh, if that's okay so um, I'm going to play this little clip, and then uh, we'll have a few questions. Uh, if anyone in the chat has some sensible and polite questions, um, I will absolutely address them to Mr. Butler as well. Party, which you do not form immediately now. You form a party over time in the next six months to the next year, and you work to do so from here on in. You take the party from Nick Griffin from the inside out now and in the next year. The present leader is a wily fox. He's associated with everyone who dress up in uniform through to members of UKIP. He's adopted every political position that it's possible to adopt in this spectrum of opinion. Enormous amounts of money have gone through that organization, particularly in the last two to four years. But all of that is history. And as we look around this society now, the people need an alternative to the liberal consensus. Nobody wants to vote Labour deep down anymore. No one wants to vote Tory deep down anymore. No one wants to vote Liberal Democrat deep down anymore but they will not vote for his party under its present aspect. What they might vote for is a cleaned up, new branded British National Party, which has a different identity and a different leadership. But there is one thing that's quite true of the last 13 years of the British National Party, and that is if you have a dictator, and that party has been run the way Libya has been run for 40 years, that party has been run under the present leader the way a third world country is run. They say they're opposed to third world immigration, but that party is run the way Burkina Faso is run. That is how that party is run. None of the people who've been the treasurer of that party were really the treasurer. The treasurer is someone else. Everyone knows that. To have a party that has a chance, you can't be whiter than white and purer than pure, but you've got to be clean. You've got to be reasonably clean. What did people think of Panorama? 
What did people think of leaving the room so you won't be spoken to? You only leave the room because the questions are unanswerable and you can't answer them. And you know that you can't answer them. But we're here to discuss the future and not the past. What will happen? And the left is delighted about what's going on. The left sees the whole spectrum from UKIP outwards breaking down into small Fissa Paris groups where everyone's in their own little sect and people don't talk to each other. And the present leader has brought things forwards and now contrived to ruin it all. And they're delighted. So the way to stop it being ruined is to reconstitute it all over time. You've got a jigsaw. And somebody's thrown the jigsaw on the ground and all the pieces are higgledy-piggledy and hell mail. Hell, and you've got to bring them back together again and reconstitute them and even turn them upright so that you can actually stitch them together again to make a coherent pattern or picture. That's what faces us. What can be done is the process of firstly getting the pieces together, then getting them up the right way, then knitting them back together. You won't do that in one afternoon in Leicestershire, but you may do that over about a year as you knit people together. You certainly need a nucleus of people to come together and you cannot form a party through detestation of one political individual. It has to be got a much broader and wider extent than that. The reason why these little micro parties that have been formed hitherto won't go anywhere is they are largely the gasping last gesture of people who've been thrown out of that organization by the present incumbent and his clique. What you need is to bring together everybody that can be brought together into a network or a confederation of people who will go forward from today so to do. So you've got to form something out of, from today's meeting. Otherwise, it will be just another talking shop in the Midlands. What I propose is that a national federation is formed of like-minded people inside and outside the British National Party who may well move to form a political party in the next year. That gives people the chance. <laughs> to reconstitute the party civically and socially prior to possibly forming a new one a year from now so that the present leadership knows that they're living on borrowed time and that they basically only have really <clears throat> six months to a year to prove that they're different to what everyone now thinks that they are or to step aside, which is unlikely and impossible, or to be driven through bankruptcy and criminality into penury and ruin, or to be taken over by new forces. Politics is about vitality and politics is about energy. There's no energy in that party anymore and no one will do anything for the present incumbent and his leadership. The energy is here. The energy is here in this room. See, it's not wasted. Um, Mr. Bollard, do you remember him doing that speech? I wasn't there. I know where it was. It was the, um, it was in a, well, I think it was about 2011, um, after Andrew Bronze um, did his leadership challenge, there was a sort, there was a, um, a preliminary meeting to set up a new group, a, a rival party uh, that eventually was called, I think, the British Freedom Party. I think mm -hmm. that didn't get anywhere because they they delayed too long in doing it. And um, uh, if you actually listen to what Jonathan says, he's saying quite a lot of contradictory things there. He was saying, wait, wait a year before saying a party. But the, the energy was in the room there. And if you wait, you, you lose all energy. And that, mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite a contradiction. It, it was delivered quite powerfully. But it was full of contradictory messages. He was, he was saying we mustn't focus on the on the um, ills of one person. But the whole first part of this thing was saying how bad Griffin was, wasn't it? Which obviously might be true. But it was, it was quite a contradictory. It was a powerfully delivered speech. But quite a lot of contradictions in what he said and he effectively said the effective message was actually charge and wait until charge forward and wait until next year that's what he was sort of saying wasn't it yeah 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 absolutely i, I got that um i presume that was after his breakdown that he made that speech was it uh i think it was probably just before actually oh okay okay i'm not 100 sure i'd have to check when he 
I think it said 2011 is the only thing I noticed on on the well, clip. Um, it was uh, it was around when Gaddafi died, wasn't it? Because he was making references to it. When yeah. did Gaddafi die? I'd have to look up when Gaddafi died. And uh, and um, I don't even know when he died himself. Was so, was that the kind of same period that you like um, stopped being involved with the BNP? Well, I stopped in 2010. He died in 2012. So he had his breakdown at the end of uh, 2011. I think that was a bit before. Just This was probably just a shade before, I think. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I, uh, you probably don't want to know about this for the purpose of this thing, but I, I joined the thing called the English Democrats. Um, yeah, I have heard of those guys. Yeah. 2011. And uh, so I, that's why I didn't go to that meeting because I didn't have any faith in that uh, approach, basically. Jonathan it's, Wayne, it's interesting Jonathan that Wayne, he was, he he was still trying to fight him. back then. Yes. he re Look, he really went because he liked an audience and he liked to, to speak in front of an audience and he was invited, so he went there to speak in front of the audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I spoke to him. I, when I spoke to him before the thing even... So he was saying that you need to realign with everyone who's interested whereas that meeting was really about people who are sour about griffin yeah. uh, and the bmp so he was effectively saying there needs to be a realignment of people uh, which is what we did when we were talking at the bloomsbury forum 15 years before he was saying you need a, a realignment of all the <coughs> national forces in a new in a new body that wasn't based on it being anti-griffin but because the audience was there very being anti-griffin most of his, a big chunk of his speech was being anti-Griffin, wasn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. But, I, but, I just thought it was interesting that, like, I mean, as you said, he, he had this kind of fragile, uh, Jonathan Bowden had this kind of relatively fragile artistic um, psyche, but he was at least publicly fighting back in that speech, I, I suppose. Yes, look, it, uh, when I say... He, 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 was, he had this, as you described, fragility. Look, when he was in the Freedom Party, the, the small group that we had before, he, um, he was going to initially be the chairman of it and then didn't because he had an attack of the vapours and went off in a great big, sort of, oh, I can't believe we do this, and uh, sort of let people down. But then, doesn't it? It's small, small numbers. And... Um, because that was his nature. He he he, he was a bit like that. Mm. That, that. That doesn't mean that he couldn't make a firebrand speech, and he mm. made one of the firebrandish fire speeches. That, that's why he's quite popular. Mm. But <coughs> I'd, I'd, I'd say he's more than quite popular. I mean, look, I speak to um, American nationalists who I respect, and I don't respect all of them, which includes Richard Spencer, for example. Um, but um, uh, the American nationalists, so I respect, I really admire Jonathan Bell. Yes, well, if you look at <coughs> if you look at his speeches and so forth, and you know him from them, they're they're quite a uh, impressive body of work. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're judging him on that, if you're if you're saying go from there and say he should be the leader of a party or something so you say he was still alive then you'd be on a sticky wicket straight away hmm. i'll give you another example of, of how how he was this book which i've um, mentioned to you before mentioned yep, to you yep, yep. Uh, which had chapters on different people and he did a chapter on on bill hopkins I was the editor of the book and I had to put it together. And he put, he, he gave, he was the last person to submit anything for it that was holding it up, public, publishing it. He's built on Bill Hopkins. And it, when he supplied the work to me, it was a tatty pieces of paper with scribble all over it that I had to completely rewrite, rewrite to get it into a, a chapter. Because he didn't have the discipline to to sit down and write an, an ask, write an article, he'd got some. He developed some sort of plot. He had he managed to write these sort of books earlier, some years earlier, and articles in these 
magazine some years earlier. But by the late 90s, he virtually couldn't write. So he had no way of writing or supplying anything. So if you ever put him under any timetable to do anything or, uh, you know, he, he would just, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't just do it. But he, if you wanted him just to deliver a speech, a brouhaha speech, you would do it. And he, he would do it perfectly. Yeah, he, he had a huge talent for that. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, I've got a few questions to ask you, uh, Mr. Buller, if you don't mind. Um, let me just go and look at some of these. Um, now, where are we? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, there is a good one from a good friend of mine. Uh, what do you think that um, Jonathan Bowden would make of the state of the dissident right today? In Britain? Yeah, principally. Um... It probably say it was a shambles. And I mean, obviously, obviously, your own views on that would be interesting too. So I mean, you know, um, well, it's a bit of a shambles. The um, yeah, it's a bit of a shambles. The the whole COVID thing is making it uh, complicating matters in organising people. But it's one of those periods when of a of internal disorganisation, I suppose you should say. Uh, more disorganised than it's probably ever been. Which uh, I don't think he would he wouldn't be playing a role in um, organising it back together, if that's what you're asking, because that wasn't really one of his fortes. Mm. Who, who, do you, who do you think he would be supporting these days, if anyone? Uh, probably no one. I, I don't think I can't see anyone that would appeal to him. To be honest with you. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay, I got another few questions here. Uh, where are we? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, one of my good friends has asked: um, Would uh, Jonathan Bowden or yourself have any sympathy for? the optimism that saw loads of people in America run to Trump in 2016. Would I, would I, did I, well, I, I personally supported Trump. Um, do do I you think, think, do you think Jonathan Bowden would have? Uh, yes, I think he would. Yeah. He was, he was a realist actually. Let's say he, he also supported the, um, the movements of the new right in, in Europe, the, the moderate populist groups, he was he was a strong supporter of those and that approach. And Trump is sort of an American version of that. So I'm sure he would have seen in Trump a leader who uh, did as best as he could. He was interested in other, um, God, what's the name of that guy? Is it Huey Long or someone from mm -hmm. Louisiana? Was that his name, the guy? He was interested in people like that as well from, from in, the, in the American history. And tr Trump, in a way, is, is a modern version of those, or a more successful and modern version of those. Uh, I would say he would. Jonathan also liked the powerful individual. He was in a sort of Thomas Carlyle way of uh, seeing history through the lens of, of, of individuals rather than uh, uh, movements of people and, and things like that, and great men affecting uh events and trump is very much like that because he's effectively a lone wolf who uh, single-handedly kidnapped the republican party uh, against its own will uh and i think jonathan would have respected that actually yeah no, that, that, that makes sense um the next question you've already answered because basically you said that uh he probably wouldn't have supported anyone particularly at the moment um, the, the, the next question from the same very good friend of mine was that um, uh, basically, where do you think like the right wing nationalist movement can go today? In Britain? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the only, the, the, uh, 
the diagnosis, which he, he uh, accepted completely back in the 90s when I first knew him and used to speak at very great length with him and a couple of other people maybe over dinner or, or when I was, we used to go on car journeys up and down the country on the telephone and so forth. Um, <coughs> was by, he was also quite interested in the English aspect and promoting Englishness. And a lot of his speeches, if you listen, he said mm -hmm. English a lot. He, he, he refers to England and Englishness a lot because he recognised that Englishness was a, a trait that the uh, British establishment hated and despised, with which they didn't. They don't hate and despise Scottishness or Welshness or Irishness. Fair enough. But they display. They hate Englishness and the and the display of the um, the George Cross flag. Yep. Uh, because it has a, a more visceral, atavistic trend to it uh, uh, than Scottishness or. or Welshness. They can be patronising about Welshness and Scottishness, but Englishness, if it uh, becomes the fore, is potentially a much more aggressive uh, form of uh, local identity. And that's why the British ruling class don't like Englishness, and Jonathan recognised that, for example. Sure. Sure. Um, so he, he saw, he, he favoured a promotion of English, English identity, in a populist way and merging the traditional right-wing Tory type uh, populism with, uh, with working class nationalism, uh, not based on fascism or Nazism in a, in a sort of British way, in a new right way. The new right in France wanted to develop a French road to, to nationalism essentially. Uh, and that's what he saw in uh, the, he saw the British road to nationalism, <coughs> merging. Uh, well, you, you, British. Uh, that's why the book, the book we do is called British Route to the New Right. That's what that's what he favoured, and would have if he was around now. That's what he'd be trying to develop and foster. Mm -hmm. But but I, I presume not to the exclusion of of also British nationalism around well, what do you understand by the term british nationalism well keeping the uk together as as england oh. scotland uh, wales and northern ireland yes well uh, promoting i think jonathan also recognized that the way to keep britain together isn't necessarily by um suppressing regional regional nationalism sure. but by having all the parts of Britain promoting localized local nationalism but within a within a, a sort of federal framework I don't there's no necessary contradiction in that if you go to Germany Bavarian or uh, nationalism is quite strong mm -hmm. uh, okay I'm gonna, I'm not going to use Germany as an example because there are there is a sort of uh, in breakaway parts of I'll go Crete. Crete in Greece, Cretan uh, local identity is very strong. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, very strong, but they don't. It's not at the expense at all of their Greek identity, is it? No, absolutely not. So uh, that's the best example I can probably come up with. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you, and I, I'm, I'm presuming you would say that that's the kind of thing that Jonathan Bowden would. Say. Yes. Yeah, he he very and he recognised. That English nationalism was a strong strand within, and look, England's by far the biggest part of Great Britain. Yeah, of course, it is. And uh, unless you win England, you're not going to win anything. And within England, there's the suppressed English nationalism is a very strong emotive pull within within the white working class, particularly. Yes. And um, uh, he he recognised that. Cool. Cool. I've got a couple couple more questions to ask you, mate, if that's okay. Um, where are we? That one I've already asked. Um, here we go. Uh, yeah, a lady who's in the chat and who is a good friend of mine and who is the mother of three children. She's doing the best 
that she can to protect from all this nonsense going on with the China virus. Um, she asks, uh, what do you think Bowden would make a patriotic alternative? Uh, in my opinion, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He didn't have much of an opinion of Mark Collette, uh, but Mark Collette has somewhat under kind of um, personality change to a, to a degree since then. I don't think he'd have anything it because it's far too overtly uh for want of a better word nazi in mm. their ideological uh root rooting they they underpin themselves in nazi ideology um bowden would occasionally make a rhetorical flourish in that direction to get a cheer from the back of the audience but john bowden's position really was that the only way forward was through a european populist uh, approach such as seeing we see now with the um well in france or some national the leg liga in uh, italy yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all um, of the all of these people eschew any kind of uh link to mid 20th century european people they, they yeah just, they, they, well, they have something to do with it or as jonathan Bowden yeah. said they step over it yeah, it's it's yeah. He that's one of his favourite terms actually. But it's stating the bleeding obvious, really, that you can't uh, have a party that roots itself in that direction and expect to get anywhere, except in trouble with the authorities and ruin people's lives. That should be, you know, it, 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 to, to say that or tell anyone that is is ridiculous. Yeah, in, in this country, you do. Which is one of the things. He, look, British nationalism is one thing that Jonathan Jonathan had a slightly sardonic sense of humour, mm -hmm. and um, he, also he, he he didn't suffer fools gladly. Sort of thing. So he would have a dim view of people who who were, who were stu politically stupid, and that, and that sort of politics is politically stupid and um self-evidently self-defeating uh, and pointless it's, it can't it can't ever appeal to the mainstream of british society or any society in, in any country anywhere actually and british nationalism one of his his main uh gripes of british nationalism which is why he started off in the tory party and the fringe of the tory party is because british nationalism is basically has always been a bit anti-intellectual and a bit thick and a bit stupid in how it's gone about things, a bit blunder-headed in, in its approach by being too a, a blunt instrument. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't disagree with anything you say there, mate. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know what was, my channel was, is about. Yeah, but he was very scornful of that and uh, in private sort of sneering of it. I'm not so uh, it correctly frankly, because it's it's our future and survivors of people at stake. And if you're going around like a bunch of blundering idiots, you're not helping anyone. You're actually self-destructive. And he, he was very realistic about that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm going to go back to the same chat's next two questions. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, sorry, actually, I'm on Lady of Shorts questions. I, I do beg my beg your pardon. Um, uh, where are we? Um, uh, Lady of Short is also asking, what do you think that Jonathan Bowden would have made of the lockdowns and the false fact stuff that's going on at the moment? I don't know the the people who I know who are who are closest to him uh, um, in the circle that were uh, used to spend most time together are less into that issue than look okay in, in right wing circles nationalist right wing circles the anti vax um, viewpoint is much more popular than it is amongst the population at large put it that way yes, yes. 
the British population. In my estimation, something like 90, probably 90, 95% of the, of the uh, indigenous population go along with the uh, establishment narrative on it. Now, to taking a, uh, a strong anti-vax, uh, anti-establishment position on that isn't going to endear you with the with that population. You're actually aligning yourselves more with the mainstream position amongst Muslims and um, people of an Afro-Caribbean background. Mm -hmm. they're, the, they're the groups that are most skeptical on, on these issues. I think you'd probably be realistic enough to realise that. And uh, also, he wasn't really a, a, a conspiratorialist. And a lot of those theories are, frankly, based on, on big conspiracy type explanations for why this, this, this is happening. And although I'm, a, I'm a, a, a skeptic on a lot of the things that are going on, and I don't doubt that the establishment and pharmaceutical companies and all sorts of other bodies are making the most out of this situation, uh, a lot of slightly flaky views are, are being expressed on, on the subject. And I think he'd probably be realistic enough to realise that. Certainly the people who, the small group of people that we used to, um, they used to associate together, everyone else I know in that group are less uh, excitable on the issue, put it that way, than most people on our on, on the uh, right of the political spectrum. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with you a little bit there because, like, I'm not that. And the only way I'll get that is if seven or eight people hold me down. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I'm asking your opinion on stuff and, uh, you know, my opinion is different on that subject. But um, the, the, the other thing that uh, a couple of people have asked me Yes. Well, he must have undergone, I, I suspect he underwent a lot of medication before he died, to put it that way. Yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. I, he didn't strike me as the most healthy lifestyle person that you would meet. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think he ate well, put it that way. Mm. I don't think, um, yeah, he lived as, you know, I don't think he was particularly healthy. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I, I think he was a great man in some respects, but, you know, not all respects, because no one is. You know, we're... we're, we're he was we're, a slightly odd shape as well. I used to... This is a bit of a personal thing to say, but we used to um, room together. <laughs> and, uh, when we used to go places, we often used to share, go in a and b and share a room together. Separate mm -hmm. beds, of course, separate beds. <laughs> but, I um, yeah, but he would... He had a slight. He had a weird shape to him. He did have a weird shape to him. Um, yeah, he had a weird shape to him. Someone asked earlier: Did did yeah. Jonathan Bowden ever have a girlfriend of any description? <laughs> that you knew? Um, well, he, this is one of the things. He, he, he was a bit of a Walter Mitch, as I was saying earlier. He made a, a ridiculous claim that he had a, a girlfriend. Uh, he used to describe her as from a rough council, working class council estate with tattoos who he had like multiple kids with. There was a fiction that he used mm -hmm. to tell on this. Sure. But I know of two women in particular that he had a real that he had a real passion for. Um, the first one, I won't say the name. The first one, uh, the circumstances I, I sussed it out was. Um, as a meeting, I think it was after the um, uh, would have been two thousand and four European election. I think it was, uh, and um, at Griffin's place in in Wales, and he put up like a gazebo in the in the garden, and about twenty of us had to cram into this gazebo that were chairs. Well, each person, well not each person, but several people gave a little talk about what we we're going to do in the next year, the two years at hand. So, and I had to give a little a talk on something or another. And as each person, because it was so crowded, as each person got up to talk, someone else would take the seat of the person who was, who was giving their little half hour briefing on whatever the subject they were giving a briefing on. And so I got up to give my, my briefing on whatever I was going to talk about. And then I go and sit down 
and it, and it wasn't the same seat I was originally see, sitting in. It was a, a seat that the previous person had got up from, and it was next to this particular woman. <laughs> by, luck, by, by sort of happenstance. So I go to squeeze around to get in there, and Jonathan literally climbed over about five chairs, pushing people out of the way, and plonked himself down in this chair. I thought, what the hell has he done that for? It's a bit weird, weird behaviour. And so I then went to his chair. I'd, I'd then climb over different chairs to get to his chair. <laughs> and then, <laughs> what's he done that for? Anyway, so then, in the interval, I didn't. I think I can't remember. If I smoked at the time or not. But he, I think I did. But he went rushing out to have a fag with this particular woman out in the um, in the outside area, outside during the like an inter fag break. And I thought, what's going on? That's a bit suspicious. What are you guys doing here? And um, he'd, because he went to speak at meetings all around the country, he'd meet different people, and he obviously met them at one of the meetings he'd speak. And uh, on the way back from another meeting, I was in the car, and I made some sort of um, ribald remark about her. And he said, oh, don't you dare speak about her in this place. But on a few times we had any cross words. And he said, don't you dare speak about her in this, in this common manner. It's, uh, she's the most darling person. Oh, he had, oh, Christ almighty. And he did. He had a total passion for her, which I then found out. And they, he's going to see her all the time. And, uh, actually painted a, uh, uh, you know, he was a bit of an artist, wasn't he? So, mm -hmm. And he painted a, a picture of her, which I'm assured it was um, uh, from imagination, because it was in the nude <laughs> of, a, of a, a strange, very strange picture. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Nothing to say, is it? But it was. Uh, I've seen the picture, and um, but he, yeah, he had a total passion for. Her. They fell out over something, and. Uh, then he transferred his, his uh, attention to another uh, woman who I know about. And um, a, a, like the first one, although that they both uh, very much respected and almost were in awe of him because of his uh, int intellect and so forth and his personality, they were both uh, platonic, but not to his choice, as I was sort of told. Sort of, sort of, as I was told, and um, this one, he, he uh, uh, tried to sort of um, bite like a dog, like a, like a Rottweiler, fixing his teeth on her. But it didn't. So he definitely he wasn't like he was gay or anything like that. That's what the question is. He definitely um, had um, intentions, put it that way, and. Uh, fell in love with with uh, these particular two for sure okay I, i've been asked to show you a picture eddie and see if you recognize it so i'll do that Hang it's on. not that painting is it <laughs> uh, it's a drawing actually but yeah okay well, one second uh it's this one isn't it It is right. Okay. How do I do this? Go there. Hmm. This is where my boom attack gets really bad. Um. Yeah. That's great. Forgive me, chap. I am really boom attack. I honestly am. Okay, I don't know how to do this. 
Um, it's it. What? Hang on, man. It it's a um, it's a cute drawing of a dark-haired girl, and she is actually rather pretty. Is it a good picture? I'm not a fan of his uh, art, to be honest with you. I don't think this is his. I'm not sure if this is his. It might be, but it's kind of it's got, got kind of writing below her chin over it. Right. But it's 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 what I would consider an attractive woman. Put it that way. Hang on, someone's given. Open the web page and share it. It's from a book. Okay, let's do it this way. Uh, what this chap doesn't realise is that I'm on two different browsers. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I'll find it in due course. Here we go. Uh, so in order to get that, I, I know I'm going to do it, I think. Copy. I beg your pardon, guys. I know there's a lot of dead air at the moment, but I'm on two different browsers because I have to be because the main browser I use doesn't work very well on this channel, sadly. There we go. This should work. There we go. So if I now do uh, share screen. Uh, there we go. Ooh, got, got it. There you go. Do you do you rec do you recognise that one, Mr. Baller? Nope. No okay. idea what okay. that is. I, I'm I'm told by the person who sent it to me that that's um, I've got I've used it, Richard Ford. What's it? What's it? What is it? Is it a it's, picture that he's amended? Did I you... have no. I have no idea. It was sent to me by my friend Richard Ford. Mm -hmm. So, and Richard Ford like uh, has a whole channel devoted to Jonathan Bowden. So okay. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna no, see what he's saying. Um, it's the same as that's from his art book, that's from Jonathan Bowden's art book, apparently. Okay, well, is it someone is it an archetype that he liked the look of? Is that what it's? I have no idea. I think I was asked to ask you if you recognized it. That was the no. same thing. No, there we go. I asked him, Richard Ford. Um, okay, we've got a couple more questions. Well, yeah, yeah. Jonathan also he he um he had a thing called the Spinning Top Club. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. There was a there was a um in the um two thousands he he was in uh he probably um set it up pretty much himself or with a couple of collaborators. I think of the spinning top club, which is a sort of metapolitical cultural circle that used to meet in a pub in maybe somewhere like Camden. Mm -hmm. And uh, there'd be, a, I only went to one or perhaps two meetings. He didn't like, um, encourage me to go because he knew I, was, I would scorn him for this sort of uh, arty farty uh, carry on. <laughs> we were talking in sort of airy slightly airy fairy and practical ways about things and he saw me as someone who was only interested in the nitty-gritty uh practicalities of winning elections and the real world if you, if you like and um so he, he was always a bit shamefaced to even mention it to me and he, and he never would want me to go because he thought i'd go there and see all these lank-haired sissies for want of a better word talking a lot of old nonsense <laughs> he, he would, um, <laughs> I think he did get sorry I did go once and uh, they were just like that and it, but he was very he was a bit sort of he didn't want to mix the two worlds you know uh, no. this where they'd sit there and read poetry or something you know and I'd be, I'd be sort of going like that and he knew he knew I'd be sitting there thinking I want to shoot them all or something and they'd be all talking about some poem and uh, yeah but, that, but he was the he did 
in another world, that's probably what you would have preferred to have done, probably just sit there talking about stuff like that. Yeah, he had an artistic temperament. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. think we, we can argue about that at all. Um, yeah. Okay, another question someone's asked me is, where do you think, or what do you think, the direction that British nationalism should take today? What, what, what do you think that is? Well, as I probably um, alluded to that before, the only way forward is through a populist approach like the European the successful European parties are doing, like the Liga, um, the Rassemblement National, the Austrian Freedom Party, the new parties at Vox in Spain, the uh, Ramsbelang, Swedish Democrats, the Finns Party. They're all um, got the same approach. They're all doing reason the alternative for Deutschland. They're all doing reasonably well, uh, or certainly a lot better than us. Uh, they've all got decent parties. They've got parliamentary representation. Their, their forces to be reckoned with, and that is the only way forward. We we have to find a way of doing that in this country. As a, I'm in, um, a, I am in a party still called for Britain, which is actually in the Europe the part the, the British chapter of that group, uh, the, the European group that they they formed in the European Parliament. Although we're not in the European Union anymore. As we're in the continent of Europe, we're allowed to be part of this uh, group because you, the European Union still aspires for all of Europe to be part of the European Union. So they allow non-EU countries to uh, have political representation within these European wide parties. So that's why we're still, for Britain, we're still part of it. Uh, you may argue that for Britain aren't very successful, but whether it's successful or not, that is the correct approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And anything else than that approach is just uh, ridiculous and futile. A, a, a friend of mine asked, like kind of related to what you've been talking about there, um, the for Britain is, well, in his opinion, it's fairly a libertine party, if you know what I mean. It's 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 not like very Christian um, and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, it's, it's not very Christian. It's not. Um... It's not anti-Christian for for sure. Yeah, no, I never. I, I as I said, this is not my question. This is a friend of mine's question. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I get where he's coming from. He's he's kind of saying that. Well, that Britain is not isn't a very Christian. Uh, it's not exactly a. Uh, it's not like Italy or Spain, where Christianity is, or Catholicism has got a much stronger hold, or Greece for that matter. It. Or even parts of Germany or France, we're a bit of a uh, atheistic country. People don't take religion very seriously in this country. So a heavily religious party wouldn't really, I suspect, get anywhere. Jonathan, if he was anything, used to go around with in his later years, used to go around with this sort of pagan necklace thing on. So he wasn't exactly Christian either. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that, and I watched a. Actually, no, I didn't watch. I read an article on the Affirmative Right website, which is Colin Adele's website, um, which often has good articles, where a guy said exactly that, that like trying to impose Christianity on modern Britain is making things harder than they need to be. And I kind of agree with that. Well, you're, you're putting an extra layer of... Uh, of one, one of the things is that, that Jonathan also agreed on. I used to discuss these things in an in ordinate length with Jonathan to the finest detail mm -hmm. of it. And one of the things is that to get anywhere, you have to be, it's, it's called minimalism, where you drop everything, all surplus baggage. You get rid of all, the Gramsci, yeah. Yeah. Most in, in a communist sense in, in, in Italy. You drop all superfluous baggage and you focus on the core thing that you've got to achieve. That's, in a, it's also effectively what populism is. So you don't, so adding this layer of Christianity around it is actually the exact opposite of what we've got to do. Yeah, no, I, 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 I do kind of agree. I know many of my friends don't, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very... you've got to be able to, to drop your own personal hang ups. Uh, yeah. you, you know, there's lots of things 
if I could wave a magic wand and do exactly what I want, uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't necessarily be what I would politically or publicly advocate because I know I'm not going to be able to do those things. I want to get my core issues yeah. Yeah. accepted. The other things can can wait or, or or I can sacrifice for the greater good. You know, you've got to be able to put something behind you and just realize what's real what's real in this world. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm. And Jonathan, agree, Jonathan I'm agreed with it. Was I think he had slightly contempt for people. Jonathan wasn't someone who was unknown to feeling contempt for people, which is one probably one of the reasons why I got on so <laughs> so well with him. <laughs> and um, and uh, he um, he totally understood this. He totally understood this. Yeah, no, I I, I think you're entirely right. But like I said, um, and I would say quite a lot of my friends wouldn't agree and I think probably the majority of the people on the right who I actually like these days um, which is not the likes of Mark Collette but is the likes of other people um, Strangely would... enough Mark Collette used to agree with all this as well he, Yeah he, he yeah. seems to have <laughs> flown, flown, a, flown around a lot over the years Yeah well, there's money in in um, putting up a, a big uh, show. People would, um, talking hard. People donate more. So that, that's the that's the simple explanation for it. I, I look, I, look. I'll be honest. The, the the thing that really turned me off, Mark Collette, was when he was asked his three greatest books with all the great authors that are British. And he came out with two Americans and, a, and an Austrian. So, you know. <laughs> what were the Americans? Was it uh, Dave Duke or something? I appreciate Yeah, David Duke was one. Uh, and I think the other one was the dude who used to run the American Nazi pie. George Lincoln. Uh, that's it's right. Yeah, Mark, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. going to be Mark Twain, is it? <laughs> no, George Lincoln Rockwell. And then the other, the other one was. Yeah, George the, Lincoln Rockwell. Uh, was it the, the Dave Duke and Adolf Hitler? Yeah, what yeah I, exactly. I mean, like, imagine, imagine being an Englishman with all our great tradition, or a Briton, rather, of all our great tradition of literature, and you can't come out with one British author. Well, you know, if you want to name three books to win friends and influence people, they're going yeah. to be those three, are they? You know. I do, I, you I, my own opinion is that Mark Collette is very dodgy. <laughs> Let's say it that way. That's about why I'd say this. Though. Well, he's a shock jock. He's essentially a shock. I, mean, I don't want to turn this into Mark Collette show, but he's essentially a shock jock who, who's there to... Um, it solicits donations, doesn't it? Because it gets people in these little um, young people who don't know anything of the world, who sit anonymously in their back bedrooms. It gets them a bit excited in the same way that doing a shoot 'em up game on... Uh, their um, PlayStation gets them yeah. excited. It's the yeah. same sort of crowd that he deals with in you know these solitary types, and um, it's not politics. And Jonathan, I'm certain, uh, would have scorned that. He didn't look. Mark Collett is a different person. I, I actually used to be very close friends with Mark Collett back in 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 those days, and Jonathan was a bit scornful of the fact that I was close friends with Mark Collett. Which I did used to be very close friends with him, and um, Jonathan sort of looked down his nose at him. They, don't, they didn't get on at all. They didn't really know each other, really, but they didn't get on really at all. They, they, they I, I, never I just, I, I just think that if you'd have asked Jonathan Bowden for like his top three authors, I, I think they probably would have been well, British. Well, they wouldn't have been Dave Duke, um, George Lincoln, Rockwell, and Adam Hitler, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be in the top 100 either. They, it wouldn't have even crossed his mind to... Uh, yeah, I'm sure he never read Dave Duke's book. It was probably on My Awakening, is it? I don't know what the book is. I think it's called My Awakening. I've never read it, mate. I've, no interest I've never read in it. You. And um, I'm pretty certain Jonathan wouldn't have bothered. And, you know, I don't know which one of the George Nick and Rockwell's books, probably White Power or something, but um, uh, um, I would pretty much guess Jonathan wouldn't have bothered reading that. Yeah. He may have looked at Mein Kampf because it's a sort of a, uh, it is an important book in, in the history of uh, 
the world actually but uh, oh. in the west and uh, um, so I've, probably... I've got a i've got a uh, someone i know in the chat who is asking what you think of bowden's book called right if you've read it i don't i don't okay. even know this book no i haven't read it uh, i presume it's actually a collection of his early articles is it i don't know um, the guy in the chat who asked me jovu tell us what it is and maybe we'll be able to answer it um, apparently according to friends in the chat jonathan bowden did mention duke in an essay on countercurrents but it may well have done the the countercurrents uh, um duke countercurrents i think was mostly written um in the early up to the early 90s i think if i'm right in saying yeah uh because uh it's mentioned in the forward to this book which i think was actually part of that they duke when he got he got elected to the um uh louisiana uh it, it was louisiana senate or, or house representatives yeah, yeah. Not, to the, not to the national house representatives in the local state one in louisiana in the late 80s and he got there he had been in the Ku Klux Klan and he had been in the I think the American Nazi party but he sort of turned over a moderate leaf and stood on a populist platform and actually got elected on on uh, as an as an ex-reformed Klansman onto the Louisiana state legislature in the uh, late 80s and made a bit of a name for himself in that in that role and stood for governor and uh wasn't slaughtered in the election it was a relatively uh close election but when he failed to become state governor he then went back to being a sort of uh whether it was a uh, officially the clan but he effectively went back to his previous political position mm -hmm. he, so his, his, his populist phase was a rather nakedly a uh uh act and uh, so it, it, when he was politically successful and he got elected to the state legislature and nearly become governor he wasn't you know he, the percentage wasn't huge i forget what it was but it wasn't a huge loss um when he did lose instead of persevering he went oh sod this and he went back to being a, a sort of far right loony again and mm -hmm. So I don't know what Jonathan was referring to. He's possibly referring when he mentioned Dave Duke. It's possibly because he wrote uh, that countercurrent thing relatively <coughs> early in his career, and he's probably referring to Duke, the earlier Duke, rather fair than enough, Duke. Fair I suspect um, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Yeah, no. Fair I've, I've, got a, really I've got a couple of personal questions uh, to ask you, which are firstly. Do you have any of Eddie but uh, sorry, do you have any of Jonathan Bowden's art? No. And the second one was, do you have or know of, apart from the stuff you told us about that film that you were making, um, any um, unpublished Jonathan Bowden uh, recordings of him doing speeches and stuff like that? Sure. I've got pictures of him and stuff at meetings and stuff like that. But... Mm -hmm. Okay, I do, as I said, these these were questions that people were asking me in the chat. The guy who would have who would have the film footage is a guy called Rod Gordon, who I say who did who made the other two films, but uh, cool. seen him for a few years. So, and he did used to keep all the all the little tapes, the the, the raw footage, so he may well have it. Oh, well, that, that's the guy Richard needs to get in touch with if he wants to find some more Jonathan Bowden film there. Um, I will, by the way, uh, Mr. Bala, send you the link for that um, Trafalgar Day thing yeah. after, after the stream, um, which is on my mate's channel, so that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, we've covered a lot of stuff. I mean, is there any final things that you, you observations you'd like to make about Jonathan Bowden and um, his contribution to right wing stuff. Um yes, sir, his main contribution was that he in life was that he added weight to it because he did have an intellectual he, he, uh, uh, 
he, he provides more intellectualism to the movement than there than there was from anyone else, and that um, and that probably encouraged other people to join and so forth. Um, that was his main his main role when he was alive. After his death, I think a lot of his um, the recorded work that he's did that people sort of feed off now give a slightly uh, incorrect view of how he was. And it's probably um, feeding a more hard line, uh, an unrealistically hard line approach from people, actually. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't actually what he believed. In, yeah, in I mean, look, course. if you actually watch the interviews of Jonathan Bowden when he was alive, um, he doesn't, he certainly no sort of Nazi laugh at, not even slightly. No. He, so he occasionally made nods. If you listen to his speeches, he occasionally did make a nod in that direction. Sure. He did. Uh, yeah. But he, he, uh, I know exactly why he did it, and it was to to get uh, acceptance from the crowd and uh, applause. Yeah, okay. Which is, sure. you know, it's not a very flattering thing, but that's what he did. Well, it's, it's it's you know it's 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 a human thing, I suppose. You, you yeah. we all we all want like people to like us, I suppose. Um, yes. and that was always was, Jonathan was a performer, as, as, as you were talking about earlier. He was a he was primarily he was a performer. He was a uh, he was a presence and a performer. That was his primary and an art and an, in that sense an artist yeah. rather than a. Uh, political calculator or a calculating machine. He wasn't a political calculating machine. He was a, a performer. And a performer needs an, an, an appreciative audience. That's what sure. they feed. Yeah, um, for sure. That's really what he was. In, in some respects, uh, that's what he was. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. I mean, obviously, you knew, you knew him and I never did. But I mean, like, as I said, I've done like a pretty intensive last three four weeks of watching nearly everything there is about Jonathan Bowden online and, and all of his speeches, etc. that I can find. Um, and that was certainly the impression I got by the end of it. I mean, a very impressive man in some respects and a genius in terms of um, yeah. oratory. He was, yeah. His, his uh, rhetorical skill was, was immense. It was actually it was, it was immense. Uh, which is why I was annoyed with him when he when he didn't <laughs> he didn't use it in the way that I wanted it, you know I wanted him to. Mm -hmm. he, he was um, yeah it, it it did used to annoy me, but it sort of amused me and annoyed me at the same time because I knew really what 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 would happen when he turned up. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, could I ask you, uh, like, this is not about Jonathan Bowden, this is about current stuff. My thinking at the moment is that, that all of the right of centre, in inverted commas, populist, nationalist parties, need to have at least some sort of loose alliance so they don't run against each other at every bloody by-election. Um, because they're mostly chasing the same votes. I, I, what's your feeling about that? Well, they they are all obviously chasing the same votes, and the talent pool is also split among all these groups. So they yeah. can't. Um, you haven't got a pool of talent in one group to have good regional organisers, good uh, good branch organisers, a good pool of branch organisers spread across the country because they're all in penny packets yep but the the uh, in my opinion hoping that they all come together in some sort of alliance like a you know or something massing together I, 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 let me let me explain i don't i don't mean like a firm kind of alliance where you're all tied together i just mean well, then even even they, they, they run form, each other. an informal alliance, as you say, not to run against each other. They're they're, comp they're competitors, so they see each other as enemies, actually. So that, that's what <coughs> yeah. against um, against alliances. <coughs> I believe the Britain are <coughs> alliance with a number of 
other like-minded groups, uh, which would be positive and might conceivably be the first stages in a in a in a formal uh, unity potentially mm. potentially. But there's there's people have got vested interests also the, the, in these different groups, which tend to outweigh the uh, likelihood of, of uh, people sub, sub merging their own identity into a bigger group who's going to be in charge if yeah. people have financial stake in it they, they work for it they get income from it all these sorts of things mitigate against uh, unity and yeah. it's rare it's very rare when the only time really when there's been groups merging together i can think of um, two occasions one was the formation of the national front in 1967 mm -hmm. and the other in a much less smaller degree was the formation of the bmp in i think 1982 or something 1981 1982 so uh, in a much smaller level than, than the, than the uh, formation of the nf in 67 and um, so it's very rare for it to happen and usually the, like the success of the bmp in the um in in britain but in the 90s and 2000s wasn't caused by uh, an alliance with anyone it was mm -hmm. caused by it being more successful and uh, people gravitating to it as it as it uh, had political success and that's yeah. how ukip grew as well actually so it's not normally that's how things work out one group becomes more successful by a sort of survival of the fittest one group becomes more successful and people adhere to it but if they're too fragmented sometimes it can be difficult to any group to get any sort of traction at all and, and we unfortunately in a position at the moment where no group's any getting any sort of traction yeah. and so no one's adhering so there's no motive for anyone to adhere more to one group than another um, Colin Liddell in the chat, who runs the Affirmative Right website, which if you don't know, Mr. Butler, is well worth having a look at, um, is saying micro-nationalism in a crab bucket, which is kind of what it looks like at the moment in the UK, to me, anyway. It's it's like, you know, the, the, they're all pulling each other down, so no one gets up. And it's not like the Conservatives are in any way shape or form actually any sort of right-wing party anymore sadly they're just not but the conservatives haven't got any sort of um you know in the they haven't since really the demise of the rando come in the early 90s they had there hasn't been a, an organized right-wing element to the mm. conservative party at all uh, and um so you can forget about them but the but there has been yeah. extra conservative party groups such as UKIP or uh, the Brexit Party or um, perhaps the referendum party in the late late nineties. Uh, and um, but the the other problem is the, these groups like um, is it uh, Reform, isn't it? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Fox's group seems to have disappeared, but. I can't remember what name what they were called. Yeah, yeah, in London. Yeah, I remember. But the um, they they have bars on people from, for example, who are ex BMP yeah. from joining them, but they're very paranoid about um, people who have got uh, connections to things like BMP. So that that also fragments things because they're so scared of being associated with people who who had been involved in anything more the hard line in the past and they, they and to that extent they allow the establishment to set their agenda for them yeah and they limit themselves in, in that way yeah no i um, totally agree you could used to do that as you said yeah yeah um so, yeah I, I mean i i i i i i, I kind of agree with colin the dell in the chat who's saying if you split the nationalists into pro-Nazi and anti-Nazi, that might make a sense. But at the same time, if you've got parties who are saying, like, if you were in the BMP, as uh, Mr. Butler was and as 
um, Jonathan Bowden was, he wouldn't be allowed to join some of those anti-Nazi parties. So, you know, you, you've got well, to sort you, that You don't necessarily have to be anti-Nazi, you just have to be non-Nazi. Um, yeah, yeah, um, agreed, agreed. But, uh, yeah, well, anyone who, seem, who thinks uh, that you can come out with Nazi stuff and get anywhere has got to be slightly mad. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's, it's not really, oh, we're limiting ourselves by not having people who spout Nazism, for, for want of a better word. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we're, we're cutting off people. We're actually cutting off people who are uh, self evidently nutcases because, yeah. you know, even if, even if, I would say, even if you, you believed all that, and that was your your uh, primary motivating thing in your life. You'd surely have the common sense to know that you can't say it in public and keep it as your own little private secret, uh, dirty little mm. secret type thing. But yeah. you know, they don't. Oh look, I mean, my my um, grandfather's brother was blown up by the Africa Corps in North Africa. He was in the Royal Artillery and he was killed by German county. Barry fire um uh, and in my grandfather's house in in central london was blown flat by the luftwaffe in 1940 um luckily no one was killed because all the kids and everyone were in the, were in an air raid shot but um it's impossible to argue to people in the uk that you know the nazis were some other good guys it's never gonna fucking work it just isn't excuse my language um, I don't necessarily think due, due to that, but they've just got a whole host of, of troublesome matters associated with them that uh, it just makes it a, an obvious non-starter. It, you know, it's worth, you know, you, you said someone else um, wanted to um, reinvigorate the, Christ, the Christian religion mm. in Britain as a precursor to us getting anywhere or something like that. Yeah. But how much more of a problem is it in try, <laughs> trying to... Um, rehabilitate the nazi regime yeah, which we... wasn't particularly pro-christian anyway so yes. uh, so yeah no i, I don't disagree at all. i just we're, we're yes. just adding layer on layer of difficulties and uh, finally i would say the thing that nationalists don't talk about enough is that we need to get um indigenous anglo-celtic birth rates in britain up above two two point one percent because you know well when, again that's something we're not going to be able to do until uh you're in power you can't do that unless you're in power and they hold the reins of power so uh, i would argue that's something that's not it's barely worth discussing until you're in power. it's a sort of wish list thing but you're not gonna yeah, yeah. but it is, it is it is important i mean like merely stopping immigration mass immigration if you don't get the indigenous birth rate up won't do you any good I mean, it will help, but not much. Yeah, well, one of the basic things, again, which Jonathan would have totally agreed with, is talking about... You, know, you get people say, oh, yeah, if you stop further immigration, then it doesn't solve the problem because birth rates, of the, the different birth rates of people in the country. When, you can't, when you've got half a million-ish coming in every year, if you can't stop that half million, we're, we're, we're going to cease to exist very quickly. And if you can't even persuade our people to shut the door on, on that or even slow the door, so it's only 100,000, talking about anything else is all actually superfluous. Yeah. So until you've done that one, the first thing, all the rest is actually superfluous. So it's why, so you need to focus on doing, it's got, you've got to do first things first, haven't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, is there anything you would like to show, Mr. Butler, in terms of like YouTube channels or anything like that? Not really, not really. But I wouldn't mind saying that uh, if you could. Uh, I, I will. I will email that, that to you. Uh, yeah, I'll do it straight <laughs> after the stream. To England expects. I haven't seen it for about years and years and years. Yeah, no, I'll absolutely email that to you straight after the stream. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on. Um, like honestly, I, I, it's been such a fascinating discussion uh, about uh, a, a, like a really big figure in in national history, 
nationalist history. Um, and I'd love to have you on again one day if, you, if you're free. Um, I have noted, by the way, that one of your interests is, is the, the Jack the Ripper murders and stuff like that. And I've actually got a very small connection with that because the, there's an encyclopedia about Jack the Ripper, which includes a reference to me because I told them about British Army bayonets in 1888. So anyway. Well, I was <laughs> a total murder, is that? Yeah, they, they changed... They changed the bayonet in 1888 so that... So it was a different thought, shape wound, was it? Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, they changed it from like a triangular bayonet to a knife bayonet in 1888. Yeah, I think they, they right. Yeah, they, they went well, over how, from, how quickly did they issue the new bayonet to everybody? Oh, uh, pretty, pretty, quick, pretty quickly because... You like they went Yeah, because they changed from the Martini Henry rifle to the Lee oh. Metford. And the Lee Metford couldn't take the old bayonet. So, you know. So what about the volunteer units? They probably get slurred, uh, the old rifles. Uh, they? Yeah, they, yeah the, 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 absolutely. The militia guys would still have had the Martini Henry and, and mm -hmm. the triangular bayonet for sure. Yeah, that's true. But I do know a little bit. I do know a little about the, about the cano canonical five murders and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. I'll talk to you about that sometime. <laughs> I, I'm, we're we're going to go out on a uh, what I hope is a is a up, which is another little speech from Jonathan Bowden, um, a short one, um, where he says, as we will see just now, this. The other thing about Jonathan, he didn't do great big long three hour speeches where everyone was going. Oh. They were usually just the right length as well. Yeah, so just about good. just about an hour. Yeah. To keep the to keep people's attention without you know some people went on and on and on, but Johnson he did it just the right amount of time. Yeah, he he was absolutely a, as you say the showman and um, he could judge things. He could, he was very good at judging that sort of thing. Very good. Yep, I totally agree. Here we go. Um, anyway, this is going to just close us out. All people who have a vanguard and elitist mentality are regarded as partly mad by their own groups because the majority of people do not want to know. The majority of people wish to live their own life in their own way and they only look at these broader questions when life impinges upon them and comes upon them and the hand of life grasps them by the collar and they really cannot do any other thing but notice what is in front of them. They would, owe, they would love to many of the problems of contemporary Britain, many which are, many which revolve around the processes of immigration to be solved, but they would love to have nothing to do with it themselves, and they would love if somebody came forward magically without trouble and without fuss to deal with it on their behalf. They want no unpleasantness, and they want no nastiness, particularly in their own name, but at the same time, if somebody does things of any sort that could be ascribed to that, they would run away and hide initially, be privately pleased, condemn the people who did it, support the people who were against them, and yet at the same time have a secret smirk and smile on their face about the whole thing, and they would do all of that simultaneously. And that's what people are like. And that's what our own people are like up to a point, and that's the funk and the state of internal confusion and amusement that our people are in. Because every time they turn on the box in the corner, it says everything is marvellous and is all for the best, and that there is no need to worry, and that we're all sleepwalking towards victory. Just because most of the politics of this era seems to be running well and truly against us does not mean that the situation is hopeless, because situations are never hopeless. Groups that have been done down or perceived that they've been done down by history have undergone worse traumas than we are undergoing at the present time. The danger of the ideology of the victim, which I don't really subscribe to, except as a tactic on occasion, is that you begin to think like the victim and you begin to act like a victim. Many of our people now are almost asking for a whipping. 
asking for a collective beating, asking to be forgiven for the past, asking to be forgiven for sins and crimes of the past, which they never committed, which they're hardly aware of, which could be reconstrued as episodes of heroic cruelty or glorious vandalism that don't even need to be apologized for in the past or in the present. Okay, guys, so there you go. From Jonathan Bowden's own mouth, situations are never hopeless. Don't give up. Um, thank you once again to Mr. Eddie Butler. It's been a great honor to have you on my stream. Um, and I'm sure like uh, loads of people have learned stuff today. And I'd really like to have you back on at some stage if you'd be willing to come. Yep, we wish. Thank you very much. And as I said, when we get off the stream, I'll send you that link. Okay. Uh, good night, good night, ladies and gents. Happy Christmas and a merry new year. And one bit of shilling. There is a special stream of the founders of my channel, which is to say, Sojo uh, and uh, Adam and myself, which I'm going to release on Boxing Day, which is about an hour and a half. So, and then we'll be back in the new year after that. So go well, folks, and uh, good night, happy Christmas, merry new year, and a great new year. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye.